Good morning everybody and welcome to this webinar on Spectralink Deck Solutions. Today we will be discussing land-based radio synchronisation which is not so much a feature as a whole new way of managing synchronisation which is critical in a multi-cell deck solution. My name is Chris Polsford and I'm the National Partner Enablement Manager for Wavelink. So just to touch on some of the key points that we'll be discussing today in relation to this feature which will benefit not only yourselves as resellers but also your customers because it does give us a much greater flexibility in deploying deck systems and also some other benefits such as introducing additional reliability. The key points we really want to focus on for this webinar are around simplified system deployment and obviously that's important for us as resellers if we can do things more easily. Uh, potentially reducing the number of base stations that we can deploy. And we'll look at how we can do that as well and that can lead to things like potentially at lower cost for the solution which may help drive some sales opportunities. And then also want to have a, a good look at how this new methodology works and what are some of the considerations that we need to think about and make sure we have in place when planning a deployment using this new land synchronisation option that we have. This specifically applies to IP deck base stations. So some of you may have historically done digital base stations only. Uh, some of you may have done IP deck base stations only and some of you may have done both. It's quite possible that if you've only done digital base stations in the past, it may be because there are some benefits to the way you deploy those base stations compared to IP deck. Uh, what we'll be looking at today really brings IP base stations into alignment with that uh, because there are actually a lot of benefits in running IP deck base stations over digital so there's benefits uh, to both of those but realistically the IP base stations can be used on any of the current model Spectralink deck servers so that's not just limited to what we term the IP deck solutions which would be the IP deck server 400 and IP deck server 6500 but that also applies to the deck server 2500 and deck server 8000 where historically most people have run digital base stations or what Spectrum just call their deck base station but can definitely now run IP base stations on all of those systems so this is relevant regardless of whether you've only ever done IP deck or if you've done I guess what we probably call more traditional deck solution. So let's just start by having a look at some of the benefits of using IP base stations because this is quite relevant when you consider now that we can deploy IP base stations in a similar sort of methodology, not exactly the same, but um, in, in some ways quite similar to how we've traditionally done digital base stations. So one of the key benefits of a IP base station over a digital base station is that they support 12 voice channels per base and this compares to what's historically been four channels on a digital base station but you can now have eight channel digital base stations however if you use an eight channel digital base you're actually using twice the amount of pairs on your wiring and as a result using twice the amount of interfaces on your base station interface card so um, if you're using the eight channel digital bases there is a, a cost a real cost in terms of probably having to add additional base station interface cards so if we can run 12 voice channels per base that's obviously a big benefit to us. We can run these off PoE switching infrastructure these days it's very common for organizations to have deployed PoE switching or power over Ethernet switching which can not only provide the communications to the devices hooked up to that switch but also power those devices so the original PoE standard 802.3 AF is compliant with the Spectralink IP bases and anyone who has a compatible PoE switch um, which will be just about any PoE switch will support AF it's the original standard and the lower power of the two standards will be able to run IP base stations. The IP base station supports external antenna for extended coverage so if you had to throw what is you know without the antenna a, a spherical shaped signal in a more directional way or get a signal into an area that's difficult to do so because of cabling restrictions then you can have an option to hook up an external antenna to an IP 
Tech base station and make use of that extended coverage. Auto discovery from server. So you can actually connect your IP base stations into the switch and if they're on the same network segment as the DEC server, the DEC server can actually detect and discover those IP base stations and that makes our life as an administrator configuring that system a lot more easy because we don't have to um, go into each base and program them up without or have to find them first. We can just do that directly from the server. It makes things a lot quicker. Okay, we can utilize the customer's existing LAN switching, so their Ethernet switches, etc., which you know these days they'll typically be running for all their IT needs anyway. So we're simply tapping into that uh, switched environment and not having to run a, I guess, a duplicate wiring infrastructure as we would be if we were running digital base stations. So we might as well utilize um, their existing infrastructure. And certainly, if it's a new site, a greenfield site. You know, it's highly likely that the customer just want to deploy sort of the Cat 5e, Cat 6 cabling, and use that for all their needs rather than deploy you know a separate separate infrastructure on top of that to do something like DEX. So that gives us another benefit. Also, a lot neater. We don't have to use punch down blocks um, to wire in our, our digital base stations with IP base stations. It's just an RJ45 at each end. Um, you know, straight through cabling, Cat 5e as we said, or Cat 6 and gives us a lot quicker and also neater solution there. And that basically means it's easier to deploy initially and also we can add more bases as required without too much trouble. Another thing it gives us the potential to do with IP deck base stations is have multiple sites. So we might have, let's say, a head office with a deck server and some IP base stations for coverage there, but we also might have some branch offices that run deck handsets and those base stations at those remote sites can connect back through the deck server via a WAN link and provide coverage at the branch locations and we don't then have to deploy a deck server at each site. So obviously that's a, a cost benefit for the customer. And this isn't something that you can do with digital base stations because a digital base station actually has a one-to-one you know, -one direct connection to the base station interface card in the deck server. And you can't do that across multiple sites. So you can see that there's quite a few benefits of running IP base stations over the digital base stations and I guess this is all relevant given what we're looking at today so I just wanted to touch on some of that as a starting point. Also worth pointing out that if you've got a deck server 2500 or 8000 you can also run a mix of IP base stations and digital base stations as well so that just gives us greater flexibility. In a multi-cell deck system it's critical that you have synchronization. <clears throat> so all the base stations in a multi-cell deck system have to be synchronized to each other. And this facilitates handover. So if a user is on a call, or even if they're not on a call, um, obviously the handset needs to stay in communication with the deck infrastructure. So having the synchronization there allows them to move about the facility and have the handset handover between the different base stations to maintain correct coverage and correct signal and all that type of thing. So when they do need to make a call or receive a call, they can do that. And also, if they're on a call and let's say they're handing off from base station A, which they're currently on, uh, which may be on, let's say, a, quite a long cable run, and they're handing over to base station B because they're moving in that direction, base station B may be on a much shorter cable run, then when they hand over, the system will also use that synchronization to insert the appropriate amount of delay into the, the call during that handover process to make sure that the users on the phone have a, a smooth handover experience and actually won't be able to tell that uh, it's handed over because there's no interruption or you know, distortion of the audio stream during that handover. So in IP deck base stations, traditionally what we've had to do is synchronize these over the air and that means using one of our 12 voice channels on the IP deck base stations to maintain a synchronization state with the other base stations. So we cut back to 11 channels and we're synchronizing, we're managing this over the air and that's in direct comparison to digital deck where we've done that over the wiring in the past. So we've got a user, obviously they're talking to a base station or they're communicating with a base station while they're um, on the deck call as they move throughout the facility. Their handset will hand over between the different base stations as required 
However, the base stations always maintain the synchronization state to facilitate that activity. So just having a look at how that um, has happened historically, as we said, digital base stations have a direct um, com connection to the, the interface card in the DEX server, and the DEX server manages that directly over the wire. So you know, that means we've got a reliable connection because it's a, it's a wide connection. Um, the base station is always in direct contact with the DEX server, and the DEX server can manage that process directly. With IP DEC base stations, historically there hasn't been an effective method to support synchronization over the wide infrastructure. Uh, it's a very time sensitive requirement and just hasn't been possible previously over an Ethernet LAN or local area network. So we had to synchronize over the air using the RF capability of the radios in the base stations. If you look at the picture on the right there, just to really quickly explain how that works. Um, there's a master radio, which is one of the base stations in the synchronization chain in an IP deck solution, and all the other base stations, either directly or via an intermediate base station, need to synchronize back to that master base station to maintain synchronization. That master base station essentially is the master clock for the synchronization chain there. Um, if you look at the arrows, the, the green arrows indicate a primary sync source. So for each base station, you have to specify a primary sync source and a secondary sync source. So if a base station is located adjacent to other base stations in such a way that it can have enough signal overlap to not only support a primary sync source, as indicated by the green arrow there, it can also have an alternative sync source as an alternative path back to the master base. If the primary sync source is lost, then we can also set that um, as a bit of redundancy. If you look at the base in the top right hand corner, it doesn't have any other adjacent bases to um, synchronize by to get back to the master base. So it has to set its primary and secondary sync source to an intermediate base. So what's the issue with this? Um, or one of the, I suppose, the uh, vulnerabilities of this is that if a base station in that synchronization chain goes down for some reason, now that could be for a number of reasons, maybe um, there's a, an issue with the cabling or the cable. Maybe there's a you know something wrong with the uh, switch port that it's connected to, the PoE switch port. Maybe there's something wrong with the base station itself, and that goes off the air. Any other base stations that use that downed base to connect back to the master will actually lose synchronization, and as a result, any user on that base station that's down, or any other base station that's using that as a sync source if it doesn't have an alternative path back to the master, users on that base will, or bases will not be able to make or receive calls and certainly won't be able to do a, a handoff either. So that's a, a big issue for us. If the master base itself were to go down, then every other base station in the synchronization chain would lose synchronization and as a result, the whole system effectively falls over as far as being able to support phone calls on the DEX system until someone actually comes in, a, a technician, and replaces that down base station um, and then also has to manually do some reconfiguration of the synchronization chain to bring that synchronization chain back up and then get the system working again. So you can see how that's uh, quite vulnerable in certain ways as compared to what the digital base stations do. If a digital base station goes down, the area that it provides coverage to will lose coverage and ability to make and receive calls, but all the other base stations are independent of that as far as synchronization is concerned and won't be affected. Configuring an over-the-air synchronization chain also is traditionally been the most difficult or complex part of configuring an IP deck solution or a solution using IP deck base stations um, because we're actually having to use that over-the-air synchronization. It means a couple of things. It means first of all we have to take a, a lot more care when we do our site survey uh, to ensure that uh, you know our layouts are correct, our placement is correct, and hopefully we can work in. Um, a layout in such a way that we can have not only a primary sync source but also a secondary sync source for the base stations there to find their way back to the master. Uh, and then we need to use that information and configure each of the IP base stations individually and point them at their sync sources. So if you look at the little smaller insert picture on the bottom left hand side of the screen, that's the configuration page of one of the IP deck base stations that would be in the solution on the plan here. And we can see in the red circle there how it sees the adjacent base stations in terms of signal strength. 
So we'd use that information as well as you know what we've got from our site survey there, and we'd actually go in under the synchronisation section of that base station configuration, and we would set both the primary radio sync and a secondary radio sync as the RPN or um, radio part numbers of the other base stations in the system or the base station that we're going to actually use to synchronise base station number two. So if we have the option we could synchronise uh, let's say RPN zero as our primary sync source and RPN one as our secondary sync source or if we only had one other base to synchronise via because that's all our coverage allowed for, we simply put that base station as both the primary and secondary sync source. What we have to do though is we have to go to every individual IP deck base station in the system and program that up manually so you can imagine that takes quite a bit of time, um, configuration time and effort to, to do that and that's as I said typically the most time consuming part of configuring a deck server that uses IP base stations. The other thing is because of the dynamic nature of radio frequency or RF and the constantly changing RF environment, the signal strength and quality will always vary literally from one minute to the next based on things like objects moving through the environment um, or people or equipment reflecting and absorbing the signal. So unlike a, a direct wire as we have with digital decks, managing that synchronization, we've got a constantly changing RF environment and we're relying on that constantly changing environment to support our synchronization chain. So for example in a manufacturing environment we might have a lot of heavy moving equipment, might be gantries rolling around, there might be you know, phase three power that's coming on and off intermittently causing some EMI or RFI. We might have a loading dock where trucks are coming and parking and you know when they park in there that's obviously going to alter the RF environment. So all of those things which can impact the RF environment as a result can also impact on the integrity and reliability of our synchronization chain if we're going over the air. Even things like uh, you know a lot of people in a certain area, maybe you've got a big function on Monday and you're your business, um, all those people can also have an impact on the environment of the RF because they're absorbing and reflecting signal as well. So all those things really need to be taken into consideration when we're talking about doing over the air synchronisation. As a result of that, when we're doing an over the air synchronisation with a, you know, an IP deck base station set up, there's two types of overlaps that we need to take into consideration. One of those is our synchronization overlap and that basically is to ensure that our synchronization chains are reliable and robust and to do that we have to make sure we have a 50% overlap between our IP base stations. Now essentially what that means is if you look at the picture with the base stations, the circles around those represent the acceptable boundary of that coverage. So typically we'd be looking at our RSSI relative signal strength indication keeping that around 75 for this, this reading here and then making sure that our adjacent base station will actually be overlapped by that coverage. Okay, and this is again to ensure our synchronization chain is robust. So this is our synchronization overlap. So you can see that's quite a, a big overlap there, 50%, um, but that's what's required. So, and this is where you know, if, people, if we have issues or we've seen issues on systems using IP deck base stations, then typically it's because the installer hasn't put enough overlap between the base stations and as a result the synchronization chain is unreliable or weak. Okay, so that's how it's uh, done traditionally. Let's have a look at what we can do now because Spectralink have just released a license based option for synchronizing via the local area network or the LAN, so via the wired cabling infrastructure. So there's a number of benefits to doing it this way and some of those are probably already obvious based on what we've discussed so far but we'll go into those in greater detail and have a look what this means for us. So first of all because we're no longer relying on over the air synchronization we can place the base stations further apart. Okay so we are basically moved right away from synchronizing over the air and we're now synchronizing over the wide infrastructure. So you can see already it's got a similar type of methodology to the digital base stations, even though it is different, different type of media that we're connecting by and different type of methodology, but we're not using the radios in the base stations anymore to do that synchronization. So let's just quickly recap. When we did over the air synchronization, we had to have a 50% overlap between our base station signals to ensure reliable synchronization chain. Once we go to 
synchronization via the LAN. We only need to have a 10 to 15, I always say 15 to ensure a little bit more safety factor, um, a 15 metre overlap between the base stations. So again, the circles around the bases represent the acceptable coverage limit from that base station. But instead of having to overlap that completely onto the adjacent base stations, we simply need to make sure that we've got a 15 metre overlap of the two cells of coverage there to ensure correct handover for the user's handsets as they move throughout the facility. So whereas with over the air synchronization, we needed both a synchronization overlap and a handover overlap, once we go to this type of methodology, syncing by the LAN, we only need to have a handover overlap. And that's the same as for digital base stations. So the overlap in this situation now is all about ensuring that a user on a handset can move throughout the facility and as they move from the coverage area of base station A to the coverage area of base station B, there's enough overlap between those bases to give the handset time to complete the handover process. And essentially that's roughly calculated based on the average walking speed of a person. So your 15 metres is a safe bet for most environments. You know, If they're using decked handsets on something like forklifts in warehouse while they're driving around, which is probably not really compliant with OHNS anyway, but obviously they're going faster, then you'd need to put more overlap. But essentially what we're saying here, the main point being is that now we can have the same overlap between our IP bases as we've traditionally had and still have obviously with our digital deck base stations. So again, I think the configuration is much simpler because no synchronization screens need to be in any of the and maintained. So you know, as we said in the previous slide there, for each digital, sorry, each IP base station, when we do over the air synchronization, we needed to go into that base station and work out our programming details in terms of pointing it back towards its master base station. So it's a very manual process and uh, not something that we need to consider if we move towards this land-based synchronization. Synchronization is self-healing because if a base station does fail, then that doesn't directly impact on the synchronization chain. Um, it will impact obviously on the area of coverage that it provides because if it's, you know, if it's off the air effectively, then it won't provide a footprint of coverage that users can you know, used to make and receive phone calls, um, but it only impacts that area of coverage. All the other base stations can can keep working and uh, operate as normal. Uh, and there is a, a self-healing aspect because, as we'll see in a few slides time, uh, the system actually recalculates its synchronization chain um, if that happens and new adjacencies are formed or synchronization paths are formed automatically, so we don't have to worry about doing that. Whereas if it was over the air, we'd have to go back and manually reconfigure things. Another nice feature which is related, land synchronization is administered, administrated centrally. So the synchronization is just a matter of going into the deck server. The upper left-hand um, screenshot there shows a page in the configuration of the IP deck server. Um, and you just simply select the type of default sync that you want to run there. So you can see you've got radio or LAN or free running as well if it was just a single base station. Um, so if we select LAN there, we're setting that to be the default synchronization type. Radio would be for over the air sync. And if you want to see that option there, you know, you need to have the synchronization license applied to the system. Otherwise, you simply wouldn't see that in the option list. Um, the screenshot on the upper right hand side, basically one we looked at previously, we don't need to worry about that anymore. All we would do is go into the base station and in the type box under synchronization, we'd set that to LAN, but that's it. We leave it at that. Um, and then down the bottom there, we can see just a status shot of the base stations, the IP base stations from the deck server, and we can see that the sync source is set to LAN. But also under sync, we can see base station number zero is effectively the sync master. Even though it's not over there, there's still a sync master. And the other base stations just with the green tick there are in a synchronization state. So we do have a healthy working system there. Okay, despite the fact that the deck server is where you configure the synchronization type, 
the actual synchronization process is handled autonomously by the base stations themselves. So the server doesn't actually play a part in that and that means we don't actually need to have the DEX server on the same network segment. So again, if we come back to our scenario of multi-site, we have a DEX server at one site, we have other branch sites that just have IP DEX base stations for coverage. Um, they will all have, each of those sites will all have um, their base stations working out the synchronization chain between them on each of the sites as independent uh, little systems not requiring the DEX server to manage that. Okay, so how does it work? So it uses Precision Time Protocol version 2 or PTP version 2 and that's what is used to synchronize the DEC radios via the LAN. So this is a IEEE standard which is the Institute of Electricians, Electrical and Electronic Engineers, I believe that is. Um, so it's a, it's a ratified standard from the IEEE. PTPv2 is based on a master-slave architecture. So the active master, which will be the, the master base station, is automatically selected among the base stations. So there is a metric that they use to work that out between each other, and then they appoint the master base station. So, um, you know, we looked at what happens if a, a master base goes off the air in an over-the-air scenario, that all the base stations will lose synchronization. If even the master were to go off the air in this type of methodology, then the base stations between them would simply uh, you know, run their algorithms and work out based on the result who will be appointed as the new master and just go from there. Each network segment will have one active master and the remaining base stations will be slaves. So again, whether that's the single site um, or a multi-site solution or deployment, that will happen on each of the sites. And realistically, you know, that is still similar to how it would be with over the air sync, but again, the difference being that we don't need to manually configure that. And the current synchronization state isn't disturbed or disrupted when that base station goes down. So it doesn't have an impact as far as the user is concerned, and I guess you know that comes back to the self-healing aspect that we mentioned in a previous slide there. So what are the, some of the requirements that we need to have to run this solution? Okay, well, first of all, we need to have all our base stations, which are IP base stations, obviously, and the DEC server running a recent version of firmware, which would be PCS 15C or something after that. So I think at this stage 15C is still the latest version. Um, however, you know, all you need to do if you want to run this and you have an older version running is go to Spectralink support site and download and update your systems to 15C. So that's both the bases and the tech server. We also need to have the license. So this is a license based feature. Uh, land synchronization license needs to be on the system to support this and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, um, in a few slides time as well. PTP uses or relies on the network supporting um, quite um, strict you know, time management. So uh, um, we need to have multicast, or we use, it uses multicast traffic. And so to support that, the timing of the network needs to be good. So we can't have too much delay. We can't have too much jitter. Um, that will affect the operation and potentially you know, mean that if you've got non-managed switches, just sort of cheap low-end switches, it may not be an option because you know we need to have switches and we'd always recommend using enterprise switches so you can make sure that your timing uh, all those switches can manage the traffic in such a way it's not going to introduce um, you know a lot of delay or jitter and those sort of things which could impact on this on the operation of that um, land synchronization and the um, precision time protocol which uses a multicast methodology so as it says here, um, it does use multicast packets. So, and with Precision Time Protocol, the multicast packets can't traverse routers, so they have to stay on your local network segment. Okay. So, um, basically, we want to have some sort of methodology or mechanism to manage the multicast traffic. So, the switches must allow multicast traffic to and from all the base stations, and 
There's a number of ways you can handle multicast traffic on a switch. One thing you don't want to do is have a non-managed switch or an unmanaged switch because they can't handle multicast traffic or they can't manage it. So basically, you know, they would just treat it as broadcast traffic and send the traffic out of every port on the switch um, through every transmission, even when some of those ports will be connected to devices that have absolutely nothing to do with the multicast traffic in question. For example, you might have a mixture of base stations, PCs, printer, um, and other devices on your network switch, and all you want to do is have this PTP multicast traffic going between the base stations and the deck server. Okay, so you want to make sure you can manage that. The most common way that this is done is with IGMP snooping, which is Internet Group Management Protocol, and essentially that's a feature on pretty much any managed switch, which means that the switch can uh, intelligently learn which devices connected to the switch are using multicast and basically then only send that multicast traffic to those devices that require it and are actually involved in that um, multicast exchange of traffic. So it limits the amount of traffic going over the network, uh, it eliminates unnecessary traffic going over the network and it can dynamically learn if a new device is connected or a device that was connected leaves the switch and it won't continue to send that multicast traffic around those ports. So um, any layer two managed switch should support uh, IGMP snooping. So again, you really want to make sure that you have a enterprise or a managed layer two switch. And it doesn't mean an expensive switch. There's a lot of managed switches that will do. You know, IGMP snooping is a standard uh, managed feature of a switch. And it also means you're going to have less issues regarding timing. You know, they'll forward the traffic a lot quicker, less delay, reduces the likelihood of jitter being involved, and also lets you do things like you know, VLAN tagging. So Obviously, if you're running voice and data off a, a switch, you want to make sure that you're prioritising your voice traffic. So you can also use the VLAN features of managed switches. So there's a whole range of reasons why you want to be using managed switches for this type of thing. Uh, but certainly in relation to this, the IGMP snooping feature. So it brings us to timing and jitter. As we said, um, for PTP to be accurate enough to synchronise the deck radios and manage that through that multicast traffic, the network jitter has to be low. Okay, so jitter, just to define jitter, obviously in a packet switch network there's always going to be delays between packets going from their source to their destination. Uh, they may even take different paths through the network. So jitter is when those packets have different lengths of delay between their destination or their source and their destination. So packets will arrive uh, with different amounts of delay between them and that's defined as jitter. So if there's an excessive amount of jitter on the network, then that will have an impact on how this works. So we want to have the packet delay between the packets going from the source to their destination has a fairly constant amount of delay between them. The PTP have um, built-in filtering, so it does allow them to cope with some level of jitter. You're always going to get jitter on a network. It's about minimising that jitter. Um, so that'll be impacted by things like network topology, how many devices are on the network in terms of devices that will process the traffic switches, etc. Um, your traffic patterns on the network, is it a congestion? We have VLANs running to um, you know, split those broadcast domains. Uh, the quality and configuration of the switches, obviously we've talked about um, that last point quite a bit already. All those things can have an impact. Every base station has the capability to become a master or slave regardless of its position in the network topology. So again, that's something that will be dynamically worked out between the base stations there. You need to consider the placement or the position of the master slave when deploying the bases. As it says, any base station can become a master or slave, but you want to make sure there's not too many uh, forwarding points in the tra traffic path between the master and the slave bases, which could introduce things like the jitter and the delay that, as we said, can impact on how this works. So if you look at um, this particular picture here, you'll see there's three switches between the master and the slave. Um, in the lab, Spectralink have done the testing and they've been successful in having up to five switches between the master and slave base stations. So you know, I think that would cover quite a large site, you know, multi-storey site with you know, a number of IDFs. So, so that should be fine for pretty much any customer site that you have in a practical sense. 
Okay, let's have a look at the cost factor. How does this impact on cost? Because it certainly can have a, a big impact and the amount of impact that it will have will scale with the size of the systems that you want to deploy. So first of all, I guess we should mention that the cost of an IP deck base station is approximately $1,400. So it's not a cheap device. Um, and yes, it is more expensive than a digital base station. But as we said at the start, there's a number of reasons why an IP deck base station we could say is better than a, a digital base station, not in, in what it does in terms of the quality of the calls it supports, but in some of the other benefits that we can have there. So um, if we're deploying, like we said, compared to over the air, we're deploying a fewer number of base stations as a result of us being able to put a bigger spacing between those base stations or IP base stations. We don't need as big an overlap. So that will mean on anything other than quite a small site, it'll mean we, we can actually deploy less base stations to cover the same size area. Okay, so obviously that will mean as the size of the site and the deployment increases, then we can save more money because we'll be able to drop more base stations as that scales up. So from a cost point of view, the licenses that you, or the license that you need to support this sync over land feature uh, depends on the you know. So for I guess the smaller system in both the IP deck range and the standard deck range, which is the 400 and the 2500, 1321 dollars RRP, and for the larger systems, it's a shade over 2000 dollars. Okay, so keep that pricing in mind along with the pricing of the IP base station itself. Let's have a, just a look at one example of how that might look in a real world environment. So here we've got our IP deck server 6500, and that's costing us. $2,354. This is retail pricing. We have 20 IP base stations at $1,400 a pop and we're doing over the air synchronization. So our total system cost is about $30,000 plus. Let's say we change that. Now we move to putting a land sync license on that and that's going to add $2,172. But because we're now syncing over the LAN, we can actually drop or reduce the number of IP base stations we're deploying. So we've gone from 20 to 15 IP base stations. So we're saving five times $1,400. Yes, we're adding a license worth a couple of grand on there, but our total cost now has come down to $25,500, giving us a potential saving there of just under $5,000 by using Lansing as compared to over the air synchronization there. Now, generally as a rule of thumb, we'd probably say you use approximately 30% less base stations if you're placing them for land synchronization or digital decked as compared to over the air sync with IP decked. So even that's been a bit conservative because we just dropped 25% of our bases. So it actually might be slightly bigger saving there. And keep in mind here, all we've talked about here is the actual cost of the product. If we're deploying five less bases, it means we're doing a lot less cabling. Um, we're not having to do five additional cable runs um, they might be into tr areas that are you know, tricky to do, might be cost involved in that. Um, we're obviously saving the time component of running those cables and we're also saving the time component in the configuration of the deck system because we no, need, no longer need to do that over the air synchronization configuration of all the IP deck base stations. So the actual cost will be quite a bit more than that $5,000 of hardware. It extends to all those other things as well. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so just to wrap up, I think we've covered off all the key points there. Obviously, there's, there's a lot more granular stuff if you want to read into that. And there is a white paper on SpectraLink support site, which will give you all the details of that if you want to know more. But realistically, the key points, I guess we'll take away from the webinar here are we've got a more robust and redundant deck system. Uh, we're not vulnerable to either a base station going off the air that is providing sync to other base stations or even maybe the master base station going off the air which will impact the entire system and bring that down. So we've got a more robust and redundant deck system and realistically um, you could say it's it's more or less as robust now as a digital deck solution because we're going over the wire. Yes, there'll be more points of failure potentially because it's still a, an ethernet LAN, you know, there might be multiple switches that could um, have points of failure but it is much closer now to a traditional deck system than how it was when using over-the-air sync. 
simplified deployment and configuration, as we said, both in running less cables, um, how much configuration we need to do on the actual system itself. Uh, so that'll be much simplified as well. And also means, not that we'd recommend it, obviously you always want to um, always make sure you're taking your due diligence in the site survey stage. But I guess there's, there's less potential for things to go wrong based on your base station location and placement than there is with ODS sync. So it should simplify the whole process from start to finish. And then the cost savings as a result of the simplified deployment configuration and also the potential to reduce the amount of infrastructure you need to cover an equivalent size area. Okay, so that's the main presentation that I wanted to share with you guys. We do have a option for you to ask questions. If you do, there's a question box which should be in your little go to webinar control panel. Feel free to type out a question if you have that and I will attempt to answer that for you. I've got a couple of questions that I'll read out now. Uh, the first one is, what is required to run IP bases on an 8000? Well, as we said, IP base stations can certainly run on any of the DEX servers. If you're running it on an 8000, um, where you know with digital base stations you have a, a base station interface card which directly connects to those or to the wiring for the bases. If you run IP bases, it actually uses the VoIP interface card to support IP bases on an 8000 or a 2500. So you don't need to run base station interface cards anymore if you wanted to put IP bases on 8000. You will need to have a VoIP interface card on the system. And that VoIP interface card historically has been used to support SIP extensions off an IP PBX when you integrate that with the DEC server. But that same card also supports digital base stations. So that card will manage the RTP streams or the media streams between both an IP PBX and the DEC server if you're running SIP extensions or also the IP base station and the DEX server. Um, there's no reason why you can't run analog extensions on 8000 and use IP bases. Um, you can pretty much slice and dice any way you want. You could use SIP extensions and IP bases, SIP extensions and digital bases, analog uh, extensions with either type of base as well. Or you could mix you know, IP bases and digital bases. So there's just a whole lot of flexibility you can do uh, running IP bases on an 8000. Uh, we've got a second question here. Do I do I need to configure the switches? Okay, so your network switches, as we said, first of all, you need to have managed switches with the management features such as the IGMP snooping to support or maximise the management of that multicast traffic. Um, and as we said, you can do other things like VLAN, um, a whole heap of stuff actually. But in terms of configuring the switches, all you need to do as far as this feature is concerned that we've been talking about today is make sure that IGMP snooping is enabled on the switch. Uh, typically on a managed switch that will be disabled, but it's usually just a tick box or a radio button to enable that feature on the switch. And then that switch will start intelligently learning about the devices that are using the multicast traffic around the, the switch and only make sure that it's sending that multicast traffic to ports connected to those devices uh, so that's a much more managed way to run that multicast traffic on the network. Okay, don't have any more questions here. So just want to quickly point out how you can contact us. If you wanted to know more, as I said, I'd start with um, going to support.spectralink.com. They've got a great uh, wealth of information and and resources on that site, everything from your software to your administrator guides, user guides, and white papers, such as the one that describes this process in a lot more detail than we've looked at today. So please um, have a look at that if you're interested. And also, obviously, you can always call us at Wavelink or email us, whether that's sales at Wavelink or support at Wavelink, and we'll be certainly happy to discuss that feature further. Okay, so just want to thank everybody for coming. Hopefully, it's been worthwhile for you and hopefully this gives you a, an option to go and roll out some tech servers with IP stations. Thanks very much.